good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event where we cover anything that may be of interest to librarians across the state and across the country. Um, we do these sessions every Wednesday morning live at 10 a.m. Central Time. And they last about an hour on average, um, but they are all recorded, so if you're not able to join us on Wednesday mornings, that's fine. You can go and watch all of our recorded sessions from um, as long as we've been doing the show. Um, we do a mixture of things here. We do presentations, mini training sessions, book reviews, anything, as I said, if it has to do with libraries, we'll put it on the shelf. Uh, this morning we have, as you can see, um, we're doing a session about this year's One Book, One Nebraska selection. Um, and I'm actually going to hand over to, um, I guess Mary Jo, you'll start, Mary Jo Ryan here at the Library Commission. Uh, she's here with me and um, she's going to introduce what we're doing today and what's going to be going on. So I will just pass the mic to her and take it away, Mary Jo. Thank you, Krista. Well, as Krista said, welcome everyone. Um, we are so pleased to have this opportunity to talk about the One Book, One Nebraska. It's um, I Am a Man, She's Standing Bear's Journey for Justice by Joe Starita. And it's our pleasure today to have sort of a group discussion. And this, uh, this, is some, this is a format that I really like for Encompass Live because it reminds me of a, of a great old talk radio show that I used to do. So here we are, just pretend like it's the olden days and we have talk <laughs> radio. And I'll tell you who's here to discuss this book with us. We are most fortunate to have the author with us today, Joe Starita. Hi, Joe. Hi, how are you? Really Pleasure good. To be here. Good to have you. And uh, we have two other people who will be... Can good camera view now, or what do you want? Sure, that's fine. The camera's good. <laughs> we were just trying to decide whether you'd want to see who we are or not. This. Okay, Joe, you want to give a wave? Hi. <laughs> and um, with us today also, to my left, <laughs> to my left, to your right, is Rod Wagner, the director of the Nebraska Library Commission. Good morning, everyone. Rod's been involved with One Book, One Nebraska since it started about eight or nine years ago. That's right. Yes. And it's been a great project through the Nebraska Center for the Book, um, where we've uh, encouraged people all across the state to read the same book and talk about it with each other. Molly Fisher's over here to my right. Molly Fisher was formerly with the um, Nebraska Humanities Council, and she's now a commissioner at the Nebraska Library Commission. So welcome, Molly. It's nice to be here. Molly's also on the Nebraska Center for the Book board, and I asked her to join us because she did an interview with Joe Starita, oh, several months ago when we first started this year's One Book, One Nebraska, and they thought it was fun, so we thought we'd kind of reprise it here. So, uh, Joe, is there anything you'd like to tell us to get us kind of started about the book, and then we'll just kind of hop in with questions, and we'd love to have you do a reading when that's good. Well, I guess I would just say uh, that uh, it's been a really, it's been a really, it's been a really great experience. Uh, I've traveled all over the state of Nebraska in the last year, and what it's, uh, it's it shown me a couple of things. One is that books still have a place in people's lives, that not all stories can be told in 140 characters, and that people are still in their crazy 24-7 uh, busy lives. They're still carving out the time to go to a bookstore, to buy a book, to go to a library, to check out a book, to go home, to read the book, and then to turn up at this um, endless constellation of events that you all have been so gracious in, in uh, organizing and uh, asking good questions and uh, thoughtful questions. And that's been true uh, just as much in Neely as it has been in Columbus, as it has been in Norfolk, as it has been last week in Chadwick. So um, I'm just really impressed with uh, the reaction to this story uh, by Nebraskans and to the sincerity uh, of their, of their uh, questions and um, how diligent they've been in making sure that this has become a little part of their life for however long. Yeah, that's pretty neat. It's very nice, very nice. Tell us a little bit about the story for folks that may not have actually read the book yet. Although, if there's a Nebraskan left that hasn't read this book this year, they've still got a couple months to do it in. Uh, true. Well, the the, uh, the narrative arc of the book. I, I uh, some people collect uh, dolls, some people collect butterflies, some people collect model cars. Uh, I collect uh, stories and good stories, and this is one that 
got on my radar a number of years ago, and the more I found out about it, the more fascinating it became. It has everything you could possibly want. If you're a storyteller, you collect stories, and you're looking to spend a couple of years of your life uh, holed up and going over treaties and testimony and letters, uh, this is this is manna falling from heaven. So this is the story of an American Indian. This is the story of a middle-aged father. This is the story of the chief of a small, obscure tribe located in a remote corner of the northern Great Plains who fought the United States government, took on the United States Army, and brought the United States Army, brought the United States government to its knees, not using a Winchester 77, not using a bow and arrow, not using a scalping knife, but using, of all things, a writ of habeas corpus. Uh, and that battle was fought on the second floor of the federal courthouse in Omaha in the spring of 1879, and when the dust had cleared, the judge, a grizzled frontiersman who much preferred to be out hunting grizzly bears, he was so struck, he was so struck by the humanity of this man and the humanity of his story uh, that he did something that had never been done in the 103 year history of the United States, which is he declared an American Indian to be a person within the meaning of the law for the first time in our nation's history. A person who simply wanted to bury his son. His people, the Ponca, 750 strong, were forcibly removed from reservations along the Niobrara River, northeast Nebraska, that not one U.S. treaty said they legally occupied, but two U.S. treaties said. Nevertheless, the government wanted their land, they kicked them out, they put bayonets to their back, they withheld food, they withheld water, they crushed their spirits, and when they were weak enough, they gave, they gave in. And Indian people don't do that. Indian people do not leave their dead. They have spent 200 years on this beautiful reservation, <coughs> excuse me, hugging the lush Niobrara River Valley, and they had seven sacred hills where they had buried their dead. They knew everything there was to know about how to survive on this land. They saved many white people when they first spilled across the Mississippi after uh, the, the Civil War, showing them how to grow wheat, squash, pumpkins, getting them through the winters, and then suddenly they're told, we don't care if it's your land, we want you to move to Oklahoma. And uh, they broke their resistance through the means I said. They moved to Oklahoma, it was a horrific journey, Nine people died on the way down, and within one year, one-third of the tribe had died, mostly from malaria. There were no pre uh, preparations made. Uh, a people who had a rich, vibrant life in this cold northern climate were forcibly removed 550 miles south to this very rocky, humid, malaria-infested land, and they were given no oxen, no plows, no food, no lodging, no clothing. They basically were just unceremoniously dumped on the land and said, survive. But in the first year they were there, one third of the tribe died of malaria. And in Christmas week of 1878, Standing Bear's only son, a 16-year-old boy by the name of Bear Shield, now he lay dying on the floor of this cheap army canvas tent in Christmas week of 1878. But before Bear Shield's eyes closed in death, he extracted a solemn promise from his father, the chief. And that promise was very simple. Father, when I die, bring my body back and bury it in our beloved homeland, not in this hated Indian territory where all of our people are dying. And so on January 2nd, 1879, Standing Bear wrapped the body of Bear Shield uh, Desk closed. He wrapped him in a buffalo robe. He gently put him in the back of the rickety buckboard back, a wagon, and standing there, and 29 others of the tribe, including 11 children and seven women, they began walking with very little clothing, very little food, and very little money. They began this almost biblical walk from Oklahoma back to the South Dakota border 
uh, on a day when this hellacious blizzard was blowing in from Canada. And the air temperature on the road up above, above that day was 19 below zero. And here were this small straggling band of Tonka who were trying to fulfill a deathbed promise that the chief had made his only son. And this is a book that is just, one of the things I love about the book is it's just one irony on top of another. Yeah. It's one irony stacked on top of another. Irony number one, January 2nd, 1879. The body of Standing Bear's only son is bouncing along the back of this rickety wagon as they are trying to protect themselves against this fierce blizzard coming in from Canada. They have virtually no winter clothes, no food, no clothing. But what they did have, what they did have was this promise that Standing Bear had made his son to return his remains to their sacred homeland. And on January 2nd, 1879, the United States, by then the United States government had made 371 treaties with the American Indians. And by January of 1879, the American government had broken all 371 treaties. They were 0 for 371. But Standing Bear, this savage, this heathen, this man who was not considered a person by the United States government, he was not going to break his promise to his son, okay, even if that meant walking 550 miles with no food, no clothing, no money, in the dead of winter into this raging blizzard blowing out of Canada, that this savage, this non-person was going to honor that pledge no matter what it took. And that's one of the great ironies in the book, one of many. It's an extremely powerful story and, a, and an amazingly written book. It sounds really depressing, but it is is very uplifting. It's like the rest of the story is extremely uplifting. Right, yes, and that's, that's one of the great ironies. It starts off as this very dark, oh, we've been here, done that before, the white man uh, screwing over the Indian, the government with its bootjack on the juggler. Uh, but one of the things that is really powerful about this book is that if you stick with it, clouds begin to part at a certain time and the sun comes out in a way that it never had on this whole Indian white continuum that we call the 19th century, 1800s in America. That intersection where the forces of manifest destiny collided with Standing Bear and his people was never a very pretty one if you happen to be an American Indian. But what is unique and one of the things that propels you out of bed at 3 o'clock in the morning and allows you to indulge all of your obsessions is that this was a story in which that didn't happen. It didn't stay dark and stormy uh, the entire time. This is a story in which I think because of just how human, just how human this story is, it pulled at the heartstrings of a variety of Americans who had never in their lives dreamed of stepping out of the shadows, stepping out of the back alleys, coming out of the woodwork to rally around the flag uh, of an American Indian. But there's something about a father this devoted to his son. There's something about a people who love their country and love their homeland as much as Standing Bear did. And once that story began to get out, it uh, created a, a momentum that just forced the government to do the right thing, even when the government didn't want to do the right thing. Uh, so it's a very uplifting story in the end because it pulls in this constellation of white heroes from all strata of American society and it gets them all marching in the same direction with the same objective. Give this man his day in court. Are you kidding me? He's walking 550 miles in a blizzard with no money, no food, no clothing to bury his son on land that he legally owned and you're trying to screw with him? <laughs> you know, no, there's something fundamentally wrong about that. And if we are to consider ourselves to be the Americans that we want to be, then we have to face a certain reality. Either we are going to help this man out and be able to look ourselves in the mirror or we're going to keep uh, sweeping these kinds of stories 
uh, under the carpet, letting them fester in the corners, and we are going to morph into something that we don't want to become. And Standing Bear and his story have the power to alter how Americans viewed themselves, and that's uh, a pretty rare feat. That's a pretty rare feat, particularly when there wasn't any uh, Facebook or website unlike uh, what we have for him to go on yeah. in the spring of 1879 to tell his story. Communication alone. Mm -hmm. Molly, did you have a question? Joe, have you found, as you've gone all over the state, a reaction? This is, I, I love the book and I, I'm so touched by it, but what keeps getting me is the fact that I knew about the Omahas, the Winnebago's, the Oda, Missouri, the Santee Sioux, all of these other tribes, I just didn't know much about the, the Ponca. And it wasn't until I had read the book and actually did some investigating, I found that the Ponca tribe was, um, they lost their, their whole, well, I don't know what you would call it, their tribal status with the federal government. Right, they were terminated. They were terminated, which is a good word. When, well, that's when, the government's word. Yeah. yeah. We're terminating you. And You've been a tribe for thousands of years, but we're going to just sign a document today and, and pretend that you no longer exist. And they were terminated. The, the Southern Ponca were not. Right. But they weren't reconstituted until the 1990s. Yeah. And I was around in the 1990s, and I never even knew about it. Have you found that kind of, well, I would say ignorance on my part, but the response that nobody knows that much about the Ponca. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, it's one of the, it was um, not, certainly not the main motivation, but it was a motivation for doing this book is, as I found out more about the story, I found out how few people knew about this story. And what was most appalling was really how few Nebraskans really knew about this story. And it's just a great story. It's, it's not just a great Nebraska story, it's a great American story. I mean, this man and his story and his people embody every value that we hold true and that we believe in and that we wrap our, around, our arms around uh, of as Americans. I mean, this is a story about a devoted father. This is a story about um, love of family. This is a story about love of homeland. This is a story about honor, integrity, perseverance, courage. It has every universal theme that we like to see reflected in the dominant majority. Uh, and it comes to uh, almost an, an apotheosis in this story because it's so extreme. I mean, when I drive, uh, I was in Scott's Bluff uh, Friday and I had to drive from Scott's Bluff to Lincoln. And I thought that stretch between York and Lincoln, I was going to go insane. <laughs> and I was driving, I hope there's no highway patrolman, but I was driving 80 miles an hour. Uh, because, you know, you, you're just exhausted. You're exhausted after 400 miles. And I, these are people who routinely walk 400 miles. Uh, it's a whole different world. And, you know, you have to stop and think you're complaining about being in this air-conditioned uh, rental car going 80 miles an hour, stopping whenever you want for a snack. And, uh, you just can't comprehend the, the, the levels of physical endurance that they were able to uh, apply to, to get something done. I mean, to think about walking 550 miles to keep a promise uh, in the dead of winter with out any of the food, clothing, and medicine, and all of those things. Uh, uh, so, so the the sheer humanity of this story, I think, is unbelievably compelling. And I was hell bent uh, to try and weave together all of the uh, all of the the yarn and all of the narrative uh, yarn I could find, and to braid this into a quilt that Nebraskans could, could hold in their hands and read and appreciate the power of one of their own in what he did and what he accomplished.
uh, at a time when it seemed to me so relatively few people really knew this story that was in their own backyard. Mm -hmm. That's great. Joe, so the, uh, the travels throughout Nebraska and, and beyond, uh, has, has that been an opportunity to uh, uh, help with some of the other projects you're involved in related to this? You've got a scholarship program, you've got a Native Daughters Project, yes. is that an opportunity? I assume that's an opportunity to talk about those things too, I hope has resulted in some yes. contribution for you. So. Yes. Uh, this has, uh, this meaning um, so many trips all over Nebraska talking about from Gretna, I don't know how many times, just in Omaha alone, Omaha and Lincoln. All of these trips all over Nebraska to talk about this book that is the one book, one Nebraska selection uh, that I'm, of course, very happy about and very proud of. Uh, has been a uh, feat of multitasking. Yes. Uh, there is objective number one. I feel like I'm one of those old itinerant preachers from the 1800s who just goes from <laughs> village to village. In, in the beginning there was, uh, I feel, uh, this is my Bible. I'm Preacher Joe. I'm coming into Neely, I'm coming into Columbus, I'm coming into Gretna, I'm coming into Shadron, I'm coming into Norfolk, et cetera, et cetera, and I'm uh, bringing the good book with me, and I'm <laughs> spreading the word. Uh, that's one of the objectives of these trips. And the multitasking part is, look, and I'm very serious about this, and uh, there's obvious reasons why. One of the really wonderful things that has uh, sprung out of my itinerant travels along the dusty back roads of Nebraska, spreading the word, is that uh, about 14 months ago, I uh, established a scholarship, uh, the Chief Standing Bear Journey for Justice Scholarship. And this is a scholarship that's going to be awarded every spring, and it's going to go to uh, native Nebraska high school graduates, Native American high school graduates of Nebraska. And it will be used to further their education, whether that, that could be anything. Some kind of education that will lead to a job. That could be auto mechanic school, that could be hairstyling, that could be the med center, could be law school, could be uh, uh, library English school. Family. It could be library uh, school, that's right, it doesn't, whatever it is, but this is scholarship targeted specifically for Nebraska Native American high school graduates to uh, help them get to the next stage of their life, which is some post high school um, educational uh, endeavor that will hopefully lead to a job. So. Everywhere I've been and every talk that I give, uh, I make sure that people in the audience know that and I usually have books with me and I let them know that every book that I sell, I get, if it's a paperback, I get $3, if it's a hardcover, I get $5, and every penny of uh, my cut of the book sale plus the royalties I get uh, from the publisher in New York, everything I get from this book goes into this scholarship fund. And my goal is $100,000. Gosh, that's great. And I've got 40000 now. So, oh, that's, that's fantastic. Uh, anybody out there who uh, <laughs> wants to uh, help me get to that goal, it's a good, it's a noble effort on your part because it's, uh, it's tax deductible. You're helping uh, uh, expand the pool of educated Nebraskans and you're giving back to uh, uh, people who kind of got robbed. So uh, it works on uh, it works on every level. There's also a third element to <coughs> excuse me to these uh, adventures, and that is this very complex project that we are undertaking at the University of Nebraska College of Journalism, um, and it's called Native Daughters, and it's a three semester project in which we are cherry picking. Uh, the best and brightest students we have, um, and we are enrolling them in this uh, hand-picked class. And we have a very generous um, private donor who is bankrolling this. And we are going to train our journalistic firepower on a single-minded project, which is to showcase 
the vital role, in this case, the vital role that Native American women from Oklahoma, the most nutrient-dense tribal community in America, we have four federally recognized tribes in Nebraska, they have 39. So we are taking 12 of our best students, enrolling them in a three-semester class with a great deal of private donor money, and they are going to burrow in and reconstruct and show people the vital role that Native American women, women have played in sustaining and enriching Native culture throughout the millennium. And so I talk about that uh, as we go, and that that's a whole separate, uh, what's happened with that is just unbelievable. I mean, if you, you look across the literary landscape and there's a gaping hole about magazines, books, videos, anything that have to do with Native American women. And we eventually, uh, we were very competitive in getting the first grant from Carnegie Knight because there were 125 journalism schools who were vying for $125,000 and they were only going to give five. Wow. And so we told them uh, the day before they were to make the decision, they were the board was meeting in New York, hey, why don't you do this? Uh, during the lunch hour, fan out across New York, pick ten strangers at random and ask them to name three Native American women. And if they can, we will withdraw our application. And if they can't, you owe us one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars. Well, they could. We could. We got the money, and uh, here we go. Here we go. And the response to this from Native American women has just been beyond anything that we've ever experienced. Uh, and so now we're we've done one Native Daughters magazine, and now we're doing a second, focusing just on the Native American women of Oklahoma. And we leave for Oklahoma uh, a week from tomorrow. We leave for Oklahoma on Thursday, October 11th. Uh, and we will take all of the students in the class, all 15 of us, and we'll spend six days on the ground. We're interviewing. That's what they're doing now. They're setting up really amazing interviews with uh, the husband of, of Wilma Mankiller, for example. She's deceased, but she was the principal chief of the Cherokee Nation, the largest tribe in Nebraska, a very powerful, powerful person, a very close friend of Gloria Steinem's. Gloria Steinem sat with Wilma Mankiller in her room the last week of her life and held her hand until she died. She's going to provide an essay for us about her relationship with Wilma Mankiller. We're going to be talking to artists and poets and uh, teachers and doctors and uh, wow. we're going to put all of this uh, in a beautiful 150 page full color magazine we're going to have a hour documentary we're going to have a major website and we are going to try and use this as a primary educational vehicle into as many classrooms as possible so that that 16 year old girl who's on the cusp who has a fork in the road and can turn left and become a gruesome statistic in the paper or turn right and become the next Wilma man killer. We want to do everything we can to nudge her to take that right turn and not the left turn. And that will be the overarching goal of this magazine. So glorious role models. Oh, incredible role models. Uh, incredible role models. You don't have to spend much time on, on reservations to know that uh, that's one of the, the most serious problems that exists on American Indian Reservation is the lack of role models. So since they can't all go to Oklahoma and chat with a Joy Harjo or a Dr. Henrietta Mann or Wilma Mankiller's uh, husband, we're going to take all of their stories and we're going to bring them to the reservation student in Walla Walla, Washington or in uh, Southern California or in Northern Wisconsin or Western Nebraska, wherever they may be. So when Preacher Joe goes <laughs> from town to town, he's, uh, he's, he's got three main objectives. Uh, to spread the uh, word on the uh, Standing Very Good book, to let people know that there's a way they can help um, send Nebraska Native American high school graduates uh, on to uh, further education and that also there is this uh, magnificent effort on the part of Nebraska public high school graduates to do something lasting and motivational and inspirational and educational 
for Native students uh, all over the United States. Wow. It's fabulous. Well, it's, it's a lot of fun. And I think the students are, are uh, you know, they're changing with each week. They're, we're making them do a blog every week and talking about how when they first started this class, uh, they were clueless, really, uh, what Native American women were all about. Now we've discovered that one of the students in the class actually has Native blood. She got so excited about the class that she started talking to her parents, and her father had always heard that there might be Native blood somewhere, so he started going on Ancestry.com because of his daughter's enthusiasm. And now they've discovered that they think that they're pretty sure they have some Choctaw blood and that some of their family came from uh, parts of Mississippi and uh, Georgia. So, you know, what's not to like? Spurs a genealogy <laughs> search. What's not to like? Right. That's yeah. awesome. For our listeners that are uh, out there on this webinar live, uh, please do feel free to ask questions. If you want to ask questions using a microphone, just click on the raise your hand icon or type in a note in the chat box and Krista will catch it and make sure we get your question going. If you don't want to use a microphone, you just want to type a question in the chat box, please feel free to do that too. Mm -hmm. I'm sitting here thinking you're such a good storyteller and you've got all this going on. How are you still writing yourself? Uh, are you still able to do this with all this activity? Well, what I am still doing, and, and not as much as I, I should be doing, uh, or would like to be doing, but, you know, you can only spread so, yourself so, so thin and, and stay off of psychotropic medicine. <laughs> uh, and uh, what I am working on is another book project that is to me is, is, is every bit as exciting as standing there. It's on the other side of the gender highway. It's another story about a courageous Nebraskan. It's another story about a Nebraska Native American. It's another story that has all of these universal themes to it. And again, if I can apply enough time uh, to doing this right, it, it should be another really magnificent story, not because I'm writing it, but because this person lived it. It's a story about a woman that may resonate with many people, and her name was Dr. Susan LaFlesh, Dr. Susan LaFlesh Peacock. And Susan LaFlesh Peacock was born in an animal skin teepee on July 17, 1865, the waning weeks of the Civil War, in a remote corner of northeast Nebraska, not far from where this man uh, uh, was living, and she was born in a, in a buffalo hide teepee in 1865, and 24 years later, she graduated from the Philadelphia School of Medicine and became the first female Native American doctor in the history of the United States. So tracking, how does somebody born in a Buffalo High Teepee in rural Nebraska in 1865, how did they become a doctor 24 years later, competing against the daughters of all the Brahmins on the East Coast? And I'm guessing that Wanamaker's daughter in Philadelphia had a better high school chemistry <laughs> class than Susan did, and yet Susan, she graduated number one in her class. She didn't just graduate, she graduated as the valedictorian of her class. How in that? How is that possible? How is that possible? I mean, and that's what the book is going to explain. And she became the darling of all of the people uh, on the East Coast who, you know, thought she was the greatest and they were thrilled and proud to have her as their friend and they begged her to stay on the East Coast where she could have had a very cushy posh life, living in a beautiful Victorian home, having all of the trappings of uh, civilization, and she didn't consider it for a second. The reason she wanted to become a doctor was to get back to her people as soon as she could and spend the rest of her life taking care of them, uh, healing their injuries, sewing uh, their wounds, delivering their babies, comforting them uh, on their deathbed, uh, and that's what she did. 
She spent the rest of her life. She bought a house in Wald Hill, Nebraska that still is there, that's occupied by a really wonderful friend, by a stabler. When Dr. Susan lived there in the 1890s and early 1900s, uh, it was on a high hill in Wald Hill. It's a three-story uh, wood house, and she would hang a yellow lantern outside the house so that in fierce blizzards or summer thunderstorms, anybody in need of medical help would be able to find her house. And the last years of her life, she had horrendous bone cancer. Uh, and if you read her letters and you read the accounts of uh, how debilitating and painful this was, and she still would not allow herself to lay in bed day, day after day. She would force herself to get in the buggy and go over these bouncing, rolling hills to deliver the baby. Um, and she was able to organize the Omaha people politically. She was able to give them uh, an economic backbone, and she treated them as a doctor all the while, um, often with this uh, her horrible disease. So it's another one of those stories that has a great inspirational kick to it, that you, uh, you can overcome all kinds of obstacles. Uh, you have an obligation to, to, to your family, to your country, to your people, and that comes before uh, physical pleasure. Uh, so she's just another great role model, and uh, I look forward to the day when I'll have more time to, uh, to devote to telling that story. We do too. <laughs> so, that sounds great. During your career, you covered lots of big stories. Mm -hmm. and you have an earlier book, uh, The Dull Knives of Pine Ridge, that was mm -hmm. a Pulitzer Prize nominee. Yes. What was it that drew your interest to American Indian history? Uh, what, by virtue of growing up in Nebraska, is, is yeah. that's the lead domino. I mean, uh, I think that uh, nobody really knows what clicks in a person. I mean, I don't know, you all have hobbies, you all have passions, where did that come from? Uh, do, do you, can you definitively say? Uh, the only thing I can say in answer to your question about what triggered this interest was it, it, it began at a very early age. There's this huge native footprint that's been left in Nebraska. I mean, wherever you go, there's some remnant of the people who preceded our ancestors and the impact they had here just from the from the, the word Nebraska uh, on all of the Indian names that you see uh, you can't really escape it and for whatever reason it's something that clicked uh, at a very early age for me and it's never stopped clicking and, uh, it was easy to fantasize I mean when you're eight or nine or ten years old, I remember we were going to the Black Hills and going through the Pine Ridge Reservation somewhere around eight or nine, and you know I wanted to be just left there. I just wanted my parents. I told them just leave me here and come and pick me up uh, in a week or something. Uh, I don't want to go see any old Black Hills. Uh, it seemed like uh, the best possible life for a nine-year-old boy. You got to sleep in a tent. You got to shoot a gun, you got to shoot a bow and arrow, you got to go swimming, you got to ride a horse, you get to set, start fires without anybody calling the police. Uh, <laughs> uh, right? Uh, I mean, what could be better than that? You know, I was furious at my parents for not being Indians. Uh, but you know, I, I, in recent years, I've forgiven them for that. And, uh, uh, you know, then you get a little more sophisticated and you start reading. You start reading Crazy Horse, Strange Man, with Coco Olives, or, mm -hmm. or, or Black Elk Speaks, or, you know, hundreds and hundreds of books. Sun of the Morning Star, I mean, endless books on this topic. And, you know, by and by, you, you know, you, one of your passions is, is, is history, Native Americans, and writing. So, they, uh, luckily uh, have all merged and produced uh, two books and I probably got 75% of the research done on uh, the Dr. Susan book. So yeah, I think yeah. just by virtue of growing up in, in the West, in, the, in a place like Nebraska, you get introduced to that and it started clicking at an early age and it's never stopped clicking. What led you to your interest in writing? 
Is there a teacher? Is there a particular author? Or? Yeah, I don't really know the answer to that. I've just always liked to write. Um, I've always loved words. Um, I don't know where that came from. I have no idea. It wasn't a, a specific teacher. It's uh, it's just again something that clicked at a very early age, and uh, I like the sound of words. I like the way you could arrange words uh, in a sentence. Um, and I the more you you immerse yourself in words and writing and language, uh, the more interesting it becomes. And my students don't know this yet, but towards the end of uh, the semester. There's a tremendous uh, connection between good writing and good music. And we're going to spend a whole four hour block just really burrowing into that whole notion. You know, that the, the writer has many of the same tools as a composer does. Uh, they have quarter notes and eighth notes and full notes, and they can control the flow of the sound. You know, sometimes it speeds up, sometimes music slows down, sometimes it comes to a crescendo, and then it's, uh, it, it's, it's softer, it rises, it falls. You can do all of the same things with writing. And a writer has tools, he has dashes, semicolons, colons, periods, commas, short sentences, long sentences. And if you use those right, you can create music on the page in, in a very similar way that composers create a, a musical score. And I want to show them different writers. Uh, Hemingway's music is totally different than Faulkner's. Um, and they both were great musicians uh, on the page. And there's a way to really stop that in its tracks and, and, and show the difference between uh, one man's music and another man's. I got an email. Um, Oh, I don't know, sometime in the last year <clears throat> from a, uh, a reader of the book in uh, Portland. And he sent me an email saying how much he liked the book. And he said, oddly enough, what I really liked particularly about the book was the first paragraph. And, you know, that is a really sophisticated observation. And I wrote him back and I said, well, I'm really, I'm really glad to hear that because it took me two days to write the first paragraph. <laughs> And I could go on for an hour just explaining that. I mean, what's what I was trying to do with that paragraph. And it has a lot to do with what I just said. There is a certain mood or a certain feeling that you can convey in that opening paragraph. And every single word leads towards the feeling that you want to give the reader. And the feeling that I wanted to give the reader was, hey, Go pour another cup of hot chocolate. Go throw another log in the fire. Go pour another, you know, shot of whiskey or whatever. But it's, this is a story, and uh, I want you to sit down and sit by the fire and have your toddy, and just get ready to uh, ease into uh, to a story, to a story. And there's a way to convey that, and you have to spend a lot of time feeling the words before you can actually write them. And for this book, before I wrote, I went up and I found a nice spot on the Niagara River and I sat there for two or two and a half hours and I did nothing but just listen to the sound that the Niagara River made. Wow. And it was that sound, that sound, that very steady current. And that's what the Niagara River is about. I mean, it's it, because of all it's a really unique uh, ecological freak show in a way because it has this very sustained current all year round, mm -hmm. summer, winter, spring, and fall. And that's because it draws on a lot of underground water supplies and all of these network of tributaries, but it has this very constant uh, flow. And so I just sat there for two, two and a half hours and I just wanted the flow and the sound of that to be stamped on my brain. So when I went home, uh, the next uh, day or the day after that and clicked on the computer for the first time to start writing the book. The, that feeling and that uh, sensation of the 
the sound that that water made would be very fresh and I could somehow capture uh, that sound and get it on this electronic computer that would eventually get onto this page, that would eventually lead someone to say what I really liked was your first paragraph. <laughs> so it's a very kind of interesting process, but one that was really... So Joe, would you read that first paragraph for us? And, or any, any, I guess any paragraph you want, but any, yeah. any piece you want. But now you've got me intrigued to remember oh, okay. the first it's paragraph. A very, I mean, there's, you know, there's a lot going on in that first paragraph at least the goal was there's a lot going on in this first paragraph without you necessarily knowing it. That you're feeling, sometimes it's important that the reader feels more than they understand. Mm -hmm. And that sometimes cadence and rhythm can be more important than content. And in fact, sometimes cadence and rhythm are the content, are the content. And that's, that would take me a while to explain, but... Uh, so we felt that way with some of Sandals right Yeah, yeah, yeah. The chapter one is entitled On the Banks of the Running Water. And the running water was uh, the Indian translation of the Indian name, the Ponca word for the Niagara, uh, translated the swift running water. So chapter one is entitled, <coughs> excuse me, On the Banks of the Running Water. Somewhere along the flanks of the great river, not far from a valley once flushed with buffalo, beaver, bald eagles, and yellow-shafted flickers, where two centuries ago the captain explorers looked out and saw both America's past and future. Somewhere near these rugged chalk bluffs lie the bones of a father and son. Now there's a lot going on in that paragraph. And it's foreshadowing, it's foreshadowing a lot of different things. It's foreshadowing the, the rhythm and the cadence of the sentence. It's foreshadowing that place, that sense of place is a powerful character in this book. Mm -hmm. It's foreshadowing that history uh, has a place in this story. And it has a little whiff of mystery to it. Lie the bones of a father and son. What is that all about? What does that mean? So, I don't know whether or not, <laughs> uh, it means that I, to spend two, two days on that, I don't know what that says, but uh, I can just, I can say that, hey, it took two days to write that. Poets have no problem thinking yeah, it would take right, two days right, to write that, no right, problem with that right, concept. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so. In the writing of this, I mean, I think, the, that first paragraph kind of answers it. Some people would say, well, the book could actually end after the trial, after it happens. Mm -hmm. But if you come back to where the bones of the father and son are buried, then it just seems to me, what were your considerations? Were you trying to finish out his story, uh, standing here? Story. Yes, I mean, you're trying to convey a full life, a full life, and that life didn't end uh, on the second floor of a monolithic limestone courthouse on the corner of 15th and Dodge Streets. I mean, that may have been the high point from our viewpoint, from an American viewpoint. Um, if you were to thread the story into like an EKG and you can monitor the uh, peaks and valleys, that's where it peaks from a literary standpoint. Uh, this dramatic moment when <clears throat> Standing Bear addresses uh, the uh, courtroom uh, as the last speaker of the trial. But if you're trying to develop a full life, uh, his, 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 the story doesn't end there, his life doesn't end there, and what happened after it is very important too. And what happened after it was he and this magnificent, there are so many people, you couldn't make these people up. I mean, you couldn't make up this, this, this constellation of characters orbiting Standing Bear. Each one of those, you could, have, you could have picked off and you still could pick off and do, you could do a biography of George Crook that would be sensational. You could do a biography of Bright Eyes, the Omaha Indian poet interpreter that would be spectacular. You could do a biography of Thomas Henry Tibbles, this 
kind of wild man, uh, crusading journalist. Uh, you could do a biography of the judge, Elmer Dundee. You could do a book of Andrew Jackson Poppleton, the lawyer. I mean, you could do legitimate biographies on each of those people who were swirling about. So what was interesting after this verdict in May of 1879 was the East Coast speaking to her. You know, the Standing Bear, Thomas Henry Tibbles, Bright Eyes, and Bright Eyes' uh, brother, Francis, uh, also known as Woodworker, the four of them, and their travels up and down the East Coast before these huge uh, crowds of, uh, of, of white Americans. It was kind of the first, it was kind of manifest destiny in reverse, you know. <laughs> Instead of uh, all the white people going west to uh, bring civilization to the continent, to the Indian, it was the Indian going east to kind of bring civilization to all the white people. You know, look, we are, we are people. I am a man. Uh, and it was kind of an interesting, again, an interesting irony uh, of the story. Instead of white people going west for, for reasons that involved Indians, Indians were going east to educate white people. And so that part of the book is, uh, is important, that part of the story is important uh, because interesting things happened and it's all part of American history. It's all a part of our, our, it's all a part of our narrative. It's all a part of our narrative of what happened when Standing Bear uh, and Bright Eyes and Tibbles all went to the East Coast and, and had dinner with uh, some of the wealthy elite of the East Coast. That's all an important part of our narrative. And uh, it's what allows us to see, by studying the past, it allows us to see and helps us to see who we are today. If we know who we were yesterday, it helps explain who we are today, and it helps foreshadow who we're going to be tomorrow. And so this, this has a very, in America, Another reason why this story needed to continue beyond just the climactic moment in the trial is that it's my observation uh, that uh, American justice does not come in blinding St. Paul on the road to Damascus lightning bolts. Just because Rosa Parks didn't give up her chair in December, her seat on the bus in December of 1955, it didn't mean that the next week uh, there was a major civil rights legislation that wiped out segregation uh, in the South. You know, that American justice is kind of delivered in fits and starts and bursts and two steps forward and one step backward. And Standing Bear uh, started it. He was the lead domino for legal and social justice for Native Americans. Uh, this. Uh, decision occurred in May of 1879. Did that mean that Indians uh, overnight were also granted the same constitutional protections that the more fortunate white race was in the judge's words? No. Uh, did it mean they got the right to vote uh, a mere five years later? No. But it took that first step on this kind of long, torturous highway that has been our history. I mean, you look at what's happening now. I mean, there's all kinds of attempts to change uh, voting patterns in various states that uh, you need to have a certain kind of ID because there's so much voter fraud, which is all a lie. <laughs> it's all a lie. And there is no massive, there's nobody who can prove that there is a massive voter fraud going on out there. And yet the laws are trying to be tweaked. There was a time during the uh, earlier this uh, the decade of the 2000s where there was some attempt to deprive certain prisoners of, of uh, having the uh, ability to, to have a writ of habeas corpus. Um, and this story has many things to teach us, one of which is it's a great strength of our country that we allow almost anybody to have access to our courts and to have their day in court. And if we start closing the doors to certain people because we don't like them, 
This door could have been, this door was closed to Dred Scott just 20 years earlier. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is Dred Scott, only it's an American Indian and he won. But 20 years earlier, it was a black man who tried to get his freedom from a federal court and the Chief Justice of the United States ruling against Dred Scott said that a Negro has no rights that a white man is bound to respect. That's a direct quote. Well, 20 years later, an American Indian comes into the same federal court system, and he is declared, one, the government has no legal right to hold him. He's a free man. He is now to be regarded as a person within the law, and he is also to be given the same 14th Amendment protection as, as all Americans. So it took 20 years, um, and we have to be very careful about uh, making sure that we understand uh, how powerful a value it is and how it undergirds uh, this notion that we are a world leader because we do allow all manner of people to have a sense of justice, a sense of justice. So when people in Pennsylvania are trying to gin, uh, gin up the game of voting, uh, to disqualify a certain strata of American society from the most basic of all rights, then you you need to get out of your Barco lounger and do something about that. <laughs> and, and, and mercifully, from my standpoint, a judge in Pennsylvania did that yesterday. Struck down the whole crackpot notion that uh, you have to jump through 18 hoops in order to vote. Uh, no, you don't. No, you don't. So... That's, uh, I think, a, one of the messages, uh, the access to court, the access to feeling like you have, you're a stakeholder in your own country. And I think that's one of the, the powerful messages of this book is the, the whole issue of justice. I mean, it is Standing Bear's Journey for Justice. And I, I think it's a, a great book. I hope that all of you that are listening to this have either read it and enjoyed it or are planning to read it before of uh, the end of the year, or, you know, if you don't get to it before the end of the year, you can still read it. Anytime you want. Well, yes. we've been having an awfully good time reading it and talking about it this year. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention, and I know there's uh, not much time left, but I do want to mention that um, November 3rd is the Nebraska Center for the Books, Celebration of Nebraska Books. It's going to be held. The website? Uh, yes, if you, yeah, you've got the, the thing, yeah. Yeah. This is the I Am A Man, One Book, One Nebraska website. Wait. Um, Pausing on screen sharing. Okay, I should shut up while it does that. No, right? it's okay. I just need to do the right thing. Okay, here we are. This is the One Book, One Nebraska website. Please join us there for more information, including some of the things that are going on under Get Involved. There's a calendar of events. And then if you want to click me through to the Nebraska Center for Book and click on that little, whoops, <laughs> I have to wait a minute. Um, the celebration of Nebraska Books is set for November 3rd, 2012. Um, it's the annual event by the Nebraska Center for the Book where we hold our annual meeting at 2.30 and then at 3.30 we party and celebrate all the great books in Nebraska. And part of what will happen is Joe Starita will be there again to talk some more about his experiences with One Book, One Nebraska and this, and this great story that we've been all reading. Uh, we'll also have folks that won the Nebraska Book Awards, some of the writers, some of the editors, some of the illustrators and publishers that we'll be celebrating. And um, it'll be a great time. They'll read a little bit from their books. And it's a, it's a nice afternoon event on a fall afternoon. And I believe the game is out of town, so we won't be fighting for fun. <laughs> That's important. Yes, yeah, it is to schedule important. around that. If you want to stay up on what's going on, you can go to our One Book, One Nebraska Facebook page. There's always information about where Joe is and who he's talking to and other fun things. Um, as well as, uh, let's see, what does it say here? I think, oh, that's about the, the uh, governor's le lecture on the humanity. You know, um, you might also mention that uh, on... Monday, October 15th, uh, Christine Leishock, who is a terrific documentary, uh, documentarian, uh, works for NET, she is going to have the national release of her documentary on Standing Bear. Really? Uh, oh, yes. Standing Bear's Footsteps is going to be released 
nationally on Monday, October 15th. I do know that. And there's a little blurb on it right there. Right here. Yeah, I'll right see there. that shows I'm not up on the Facebook page. Um, and I believe it's uh, 8 o'clock Central Time. But it's a powerful, powerful documentary. She's done an incredible job and spent three years of her life putting this together. And uh, it will air nationally on Monday, October 15th. And I'm pretty sure it's 8 o'clock Central Time. Neat. Yeah, it is. It's mm -hmm. terrific. I wanted to uh, just open the lines just one more time to see if we have any questions from any of our audience. Because we are out of time. Yeah, we still have people logged in, though. They don't always leave. Yeah. <laughs> people stay well, with us till the end. Thanks for sticking <laughs> with us. We really appreciate your being here today, Joe. My pleasure. It's been wonderful. It's been a great conversation, as all these are. Um, what do we got coming up on Encompass um, Live next yeah, week? Actually, Marty um, McGee, I think. Is that right? Yes, you're right. Uh, um, yeah, next week. Something completely different. <laughs> yes, totally going to change gears. So yes, thank you everyone, um, Molly, Joe, Mary Jo, and Rod for being here and um, sharing this with us. Um, I hope people are still reading the book and will read it whenever they watch this recording too. <laughs> um, next week we have actually Marty McGee, who's from the Nebraska coordinator for the National Network Libraries of Medicine, and Terry Hartman, who's from the McGugan Library of Medicine at uh, University of Nebraska Medical Center. They're going to both be joining us to talk about CHEERS, uh, an online database consumer health information research resource, resource service. <laughs> I get the acronym right, um, and the Lib National Library of Medicine databases that librarians can use to get um, resources and information to any of their users and their patrons. And this is related to the BTOP grant. Yeah, you know, our That's library right. broadband builds Nebraska Communities grant is in its third year, and now we've got those public computer centers all over the state, and we've got program partners like the McGugan um, Library of Medicine and the National Network Library of Medicine staff who are going around and doing training for customers, consumers in libraries, but also for librarians. And Marty and Terry and a couple of other people from those um, organizations have been out on the road quite a lot, sort of like Joe. And they've been visiting libraries and they've been telling the story of how much there is to learn from very well-respected vetted sites on the web for all of us to be more knowledgeable about our healthcare and about uh, health information. So there, that's going to be a great session. Yep, so that will be our show for next week. Um, and also, Encompass Live does also have a Facebook page. Um, so you can follow us on our website, or you can go to our Facebook page, and you'll get notifications of any new sessions that are scheduled, um, when recordings are ready. Um, oops, what did I do? There we go. I accidentally unshared my screen. <laughs> so can you anyway. see it now? <laughs> yeah, there we go. Can you see us now? So, um, yeah, so you can go here and you'll get announcements and know when we're doing everything um, via Encompass Live. And um, so keep an eye on us there if you do use Facebook. It's a great place, place to follow us. I announced the, just this morning, join us right now. So you can always <laughs> log in on the fly, too. You don't have to re register ahead of time. Um, you can just come anytime you want to just view our recordings, view our show. So. That is it for today. It doesn't look like any last minute questions have come in, and that's cool. Um, we did a good job recording this, so I think we'll be all good for when the recording goes up. So thank you very much for attending um, this week. And as I said, it's recorded. It'll be up later today, maybe tomorrow. We'll, okay, later than that. <laughs> Our camera <minute. laughs> We'll figure it out. We had some technical issues today. I do apologize for any of that that you had to go and you know deal you with. You guys are great um, problem but, solvers. You made it work. We improvised and. I think with the duct tape and, and whatnot, we're, we're doing okay here. <laughs> so thank you very much for joining us, and hopefully we'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Oh, my pleasure.